Good morning, St. Lucia, and welcome to the headquarters of the United Workers' Party at Colony House in Castries. Today's press conference of the United Workers' Party is to address numerous, numerous issues relating to the alarming increase in violent crime in St. Lucia. Today we have former President of the Senate and former candidate for Castries North, Janine Girodi, former Minister of National Security, Herman Gil Francis, current opposition member in our House of Parliament, the Honorable Bradley Felix and former Minister of Commerce, and Spider Montoot, Leonard Spider Montoot, former Minister of Equity and Social Justice. The violent crimes around St. Lucia over the past few months have raised the alarm bells around the country. St. Lucian citizens and others are concerned about their safety wherever they go. Today we will address these issues and the perspective of the United Workers Party on dealing with the spate of these violent crimes in St. Lucia. First off this morning we will have Janine Girodi, the former president of the Senate and candidate for Castries North. Thank you, Mr. Williams, members of the press. Good morning, our viewers and listeners. Over recent months, we have witnessed an unprecedented upsurge in violent crime against women and girls, which has not escaped the attention of the United Workers' Party. The strangulation of a mother by her son, a triple homicide, missing teenagers, reports of trafficking of girls, kidnapping, cyberbullying, alleged rapes. These heinous acts have created a climate of fear, forcing us women to be more vigilant and careful about our surroundings and our interactions. The girls and women of this country cannot and should not live in fear. Prime Minister Pierre himself declared that we are beginning to look like a country consumed with anger and rage, no respect for life. He said he believes in the rule of law, noting that the rule of law sets the tone and the tenor for the entire society. Well, Mr. Pierre, the tone has gone awry. Women and girls are especially afraid to go out. The guns on the streets are numerous and real. So reset the tone. Prime Minister Pierre called on the management of the police to do more and take control of the streets. Don't blame the police. Reset the tone. And the tone must be set by the leadership. And look at the first action this government took. It was to expunge records of offenders in criminal matters. Look at the tone you set at the start of your administration, one soft on crime. It undermines the police and has created a reality of lawbreakers. When SLP operatives threaten violence without public condemnation by you, nor the officials of your administration, a tone of lawlessness is set. When members of parliament speak recklessly, they set the wrong tone. Only recently, a member of parliament took it upon himself to publicly deride, insult, chastise, and attempt to humiliate a female, female social media personality and talk show hostess, a private citizen, huh? encouraging others to join in the castigation and belittling of this woman. And you, Mr. Pierre, at the helm of this government, said nothing in defense of women. Nor did you distance yourself from the vile utterings of your minister, leaving us all to wonder who is really in charge. And where are the voices of the female parliamentarians concerning the level of violent crime against women? 
Where is the voice of the new gender champion for the Commonwealth? Surely they are key to setting the tone. So I say to this administration, rather than paying lip service by simply telling St. Lucians, you will adopt zero tolerance to domestic violence and violence against women in all its forms. Show St. Lucians how serious you are by first removing the log from your eye. Yes, clean up your camp and deal with those who have been perpetrators of domestic violence against some of our women. Some of whom are still today traumatized by the threats, beatings, verbal and physical assaults resulting in costly court applications for restraining orders. Those who have publicly threatened to kill citizens for debts owed. Those who are guilty of coercion. Those who advocate action by any means possible. Deal with them first if you care so much about the safety of our women and girls. Why don't you lead by example? Because the good citizens of this beautiful country demand to be led by persons of exemplary reputation. The Violence Against Women's Bill was just passed in Parliament in one city. In spite of the Speaker's assurances that bills of public interest would not be passed in one sitting, was this bill not of great public interest to women? Was it properly circulated to civil society, to women groups and associations and crises organizations? Have you committed to funding the support systems needed to make the provisions of this new act a reality? Have you gender budgeted for safe houses for female victims and single mothers? For witness pr protection needs? For training of civil servants and the police, all of which are fundamental to the reduction in crimes of violence against women. It was Janice, a single mother of five, who told me recently, Ms. Girodi, they say they want to help single mothers with job training and small loans. But what's the point of that? When I cannot walk safely on a morning early to my farm, or travel back from my hotel job. I care deeply about the rule of law and safety of women and girls. We are a vulnerable group and we need to feel safe in our own country. As a government, you have the responsibility to ensure our security, our safety and our well-being. Thank you, Janine Girodi, former president of the Senate and candidate for Castries North. Rather than the knee-jerk scoring of political points responses of the Prime Minister of St. Lucia, when asked about crime, he responded that the penalties would be increased. This United Workers' Party, in government or in opposition, will examine and consider the multifaceted approach required to deal with crime, not only in law enforcement, not only in prevention, but in dealing with the psychological, the educational, and economic aspects which are necessary to shore up, to make our people less inclined to move in the direction of crime. Appropriately, former Minister of Equity and Social Justice, Leonard Spider Montoot, will share with you the perspective from his area of expertise and the angle within which he dealt with situations as this in the former UWP administration. Leonard Spider Monsoot. Thank you very much, Mr. Williams. My colleagues at the head table, political leader, mem uh, Senator Fede, Senator Polius, gentlemen of the media, good day. I need not reiterate 
the fact that the current reality in St. Lucia is that, particularly when it comes to robberies and violent crime, we are facing a staggering situation in St. Lucia. It is crucial that we all who are conscientious St. Lucians pay heed to this frightening situation. The time has come for us all to speak up, stand up, or act in whatever way possible in an effort to stamp out this potential debilitating threat to our very existence in this country. While society as a whole has a role to play, I must emphasize that government must lead the way in devising, articulating, and implementing clear-cut policies and the approach we as a nation will embark upon to reduce or ideally eliminate crime in our society. The crime plague that we now face is multifaceted, and as such, its abatement requires a multi-pronged approach. While we all in society are plagued by the crime scourge, the principal perpetrators, and in fact the victims, are our youth. It is indisputable that crime in its genesis and implications has a socio-economic dimension. Therefore, our solution must entail social and economic policies and programs in addition to law enforcement if we are to succeed in the crime reduction battle. Attendant to the drug-related and gun-related crime or criminal activities is the gun culture that has taken root in many of our communities. We must ask ourselves the question, why do our youth, especially our young men, find gangs attractive and gravitate to its clutches? In responding to this question, we further ask ourselves, what are the available alternatives avail available to them in terms of viable options for a productive crime-free life? Our response as a concerned organization, the United Workers' Party, is to make recommendations for the introduction, and in many cases, reintroduction, of many of the social and economic policies and programs that can help in the crime reduction, crime elimin elimination effort. There is an economic aspect, and if we were to look at our economy today, we see that there is a high percentage of our youth who are unemployed. I recall that in 2015, the statistics indicated that some 41.4% of our youth were unemployed. Fortunately, by 2019, we had brought that figure down to 31.6, almost 10% reduction. That being so, we face the, un the unfortunate occurrence of a global pandemic, COVID-19, which put us in regression and further exacerbated the situation. We cannot throw our hands in the air and simply surrender. We must devise means and ways of reversing the situation. And so you hear a lot of talk of a youth economy. It is time that we give meaning to these buzzwords. It is time that we convert this from a campaign bluff to a reality and put in place and put in place measures that will truly give opportunities to young people, especially when it comes to employment. There are a number of apprenticeship programs that should be improved and augmented. New business opportunities should be created to encourage entrepreneurship among our young people. And we should take a serious look at technology, especially since COVID has created a new reality where re remote work is the new norm today. Working from home provides a golden opportunity where our St. Lucians, our young people in particular, can remain right here in St. Lucia and gain employment even from international external agencies and companies. <laughs> Government, however, must provide the environment for that 
kind of undertaking to thrive. We must put the infrastructure in place, provide the training to our young people to ensure that they can take advantage of this new reality. When it comes to technology, we have to ensure that we emphasize some of the new emerging opportunities for employment that exist, like coding, software development, and cybersecurity. There are many other opportunities that exist. I recall that our past administration had laid the groundwork for many new business opportunities, and I urge the current administration to take heed of those, take advantage of the, the, base, the foundation that is already set, and ensure that they proceed with those programs in providing opportunities. And I speak of opportunities not just in tourism, where we have you know, a situation with many of our community tourism programs around the island will repeat with opportunities for young people. But I also talk about creative industries. During our administration, we established music, music labs in at least two communities, and we're hoping that those facilities will be equipped and funded so that our people in our creative industries can get opportunities to show off, not just show off their talent, but get a monetary reward for their efforts. In the area of social policy and programs, government must develop a comprehensive national social protection strategy that takes a very serious look at social safety net programs. There are a number of social safety net programs in existence, some of which must be bolstered and some new ones introduced. I speak of programs such as the public assistance program, which is our, in effect our welfare program where people who are poor and indigent get assistance from government. That is a program with, with the onset of COVID that was augmented and we increased it and improved it both vertically and horizontally so that people got a little more as a contribution and many more, at least a thousand more people were added to the program. I want to suggest, because we are not here making suggestions glibly in isolation, in a vacuum, and not recognizing the current actual situation when it comes to resources. I know government is cash strapped. The economy is not performing on a level where we, are ha we have the liberty to do all that we want, as we want. But with the very resources that exist today, what can be done is what we had been advo advocating and began working on is to streamline and target the assistance by way of subsidies that are given to St. Lucians. By so doing, we can save some of the, the resources that is expended on those who do not need it. We can ensure that we target those who are deserving and in need of it, and also have a reserve to increase the numbers of those who are truly in need of it. I want to suggest that we start or we take another look at our school-based safety nets programs. And I'm, I speak now specifically of school transport subsidy. I speak specifically of school feeding programs, ensure that those programs continue and are augmented so that disadvantaged students do not have to drop out of school or underperform in school because they are hungry, because they cannot get to school on time, and so that the playing field becomes level, providing an equitable opportunity for all. I want to strongly suggest that this starts from as far as the early childhood education program and continue up to tertiary level education. We want to look at linking labor market programs with our social safety net programs. Example, with the public assistance program, you may find a situation where a household is put on the social safety net program called PAP, Public Assistance Program, because no one in the household is employed. But there may be young people who could be trained, who could be educated, who can develop skills, gain employment, and by so doing, the household will no longer have to be on the list for public assistance, and that is a burden that will be relieved from government. I also want to talk about 
second chance programs. Because while some of these programs that I am mentioning are preventative programs, preemptive programs to prevent in the first place our young people from gravitating to a life of crime, some will and may go astray. For those who have, we need to look at serious programs to give them a second chance for rehabilitation and reintegration into our society and our economy. There are programs such as the Boys to Men program, and of course, we know when it comes to crime and unemployment, our young men are particularly at risk. So we want to emphasize the Boys to Men program that is in existence, that it should be augmented and bolstered to cater for more of our young men. The Juvenile Justice Reform program that started during our, our, our reign should also be continued, bolstered, and augmented. And I want to recommend strongly that the administration, current administration, take a, a look at the after school program to ensure that students whose parents are working parents who are not around, not available after school, immediately after school to take care of them, that those children do not remain unattended to and open to the vagaries of the ills of society, that they are engaged in programs that will direct them to gainful uh, engagements in sports, creative arts, in life skills, and in assist, academic assistance so that those children will be, rather than going astray, be, be given an opportunity to ensure that they stay on path on the right course. So these are some of the programs we want to strongly recommend, we want to advocate, and we want to ask that the government, if they truly care about the people as they claim, that they embrace those programs, give meaning and, and honor the sentiments of those programs and ensure that they take care of our young people in particular, who, as I said earlier, are not just perpetrators, but by and large, the real victims of crime, and so that we can also salvage our society as we move along in going along the right path. So I want to suggest that these are just some of the recommendations that we make. There are many other programs that we we can recommend we are open to dialogue on what can be done and how those programs can not only be implemented but funded i thank you thank you very much leonard spider montout former minister of equity and social justice in the united workers party administration next at the podium will be the honorable bradley felix who is a current member of the opposition and former minister of commerce in the uwp administration it must be noted that job opportunities and the ability for our youth and people of saint lucia to engage in gainful employment in earning a living is a significant part of fighting crime in saint lucia the honorable bradley felix will expound on these pointers Thank you, Mr. William. Good morning, gentlemen of the press. Good morning to the head table. I wish to also acknowledge the presence of the leader of the opposition and Senators Fede and Ferrer. Um, good morning, St. Lucia. Good morning to those viewing overseas. And good morning to those viewing locally. Before I begin my contribution, I wish at this point to send condolences to the family of Neil George from Saltibus, who succumbed to his injuries after an accident on Sunday evening. Our prayers are with you, and I know the family is a very large family in Saltibus, and they are taking it very, very hard. Ladies and gentlemen, young men all across our land perish by the fatal terror of the gun. Our mothers and fathers explode with sadness to the news of each untimely death of a son. We can see them screaming with pain weekly on television as lifeless bodies of young men lie in pools of blood. As a parent, it's hard for me to contemplate the hurt 
and hopefulness they endure. Many questions continue to linger in our minds of those who try to overcome the death of a loved one to gunshots. And to make matters worse, the slow pace of which justice is served or delayed, and in some instances, never delivers closure. To date, an unprecedented 17 young men have fallen prey to gun violence for the year 2022. All this as our community grow increasingly nervous about the seemingly never-ending peril. Local business houses are constantly being robbed with residential properties also feeling the wrath of an untenable crime situation. Gang warfare parade our streets endangering innocent lives with the crossfire. Even the police officers are not safe as we most recently saw a young police officer losing his life to the gunfire during a suspected robbery. I can understand the anxiety and the great trepidation of the society as they witnessed the most recent hit on our national security. But gunfire is just one of the other forms of crime that has grown out of control. Reports of missing teenage girls are also another source of fear and hopelessness among members of our community. We are happy that the teenagers were found alive. But we just imagine the pain of the parents, family and loved ones. Just imagine if anything had gone wrong. I am here not, not to politicize crime. Frankly, it is our view that this is one issue we have to have a national consensus on. We had this spirit here in the year 2020 when we established a national symposium, national consensus. We had this spirit when the then leader of the opposition and now the prime minister, he gave his input. So we come today with this spirit of bipartisanship, a national conversation and strategy on crime has become crucial to solving this chronic social ill. We need leadership at every level, every community, every business, every education and political institution. However, it is the political leaders that must take the lead and chart a strategic path forward by creating the enabling environment. So believe me when I tell you that I am disappointed that this government has failed to articulate a comprehensive plan for crime after assuming office for nine months. <laughs> Passing the buck is not good enough. Yes, the police can do more, but the government must lead. Instead, what did we see? The first course of action was to expunge records. This sent the wrong signal to our community and gave the impression that the society was on its way to becoming a lawless state, one void of respect of law and order. In the view of the public, the government expunging the records of its friends. Now don't get me wrong, I am all for expunging the records of petty crimes. However, it has to be part of a broader holistic plan so that you don't give the impression that laws can be broken. For us to successfully deal with crime, urgent economic interventions must be made in impoverished inner city and rural communities where many young men feel left behind by the, by the advancement of others. The absence of this continue to give relevance to gangs, drug trafficking, and other means of survival. For this reason, the government must do the following. The government needs to continue to promote and provide additional support to complement the fiscal incentives the past administration legislated in Parliament in December 2019. These 
included support for a wide range of local businesses. One, professional services. And we spoke of accounting service, management consulting services, photographic services, architectural services, and engineering services. Two, creative industries, motion picture projection service, entertainment service, sporting and other recreational services, motion picture projections and video services, tape production and distribution services. Three, information and communication technology, telecommunication service, online information and or data processing, including transaction processes. Four, spa and wellness, beauty and spa services, physiotherapists and services provided by midwives and paramedical personnel, medical laboratories. It was always the intention of the past administration to expand these incentives as time went on. And we're hoping that this administration will see the benefit in doing that, particularly in this environment where people are crying out for assistance. We are also hoping that the government keeps its promise and that these incentives are shared among all and not limited to any one particular clique. I have also publicly, publicly announced in our last parliament my full support to this government in bringing to parliament legislation which will discourage and or deter and create a think twice mentality before committing various offenses. We need more educational at our schools and public forums addressing anger management. This government needs to stop the rhetoric of a blame game and focus on the solutions, not lip service. I thank you. Thank you very much, Honorable Bradley Felix, former Minister of Commerce in the United Workers' Party administration and current member of the opposition. Next at the podium is former Minister of National Security, Herman Gill Francis. He has a wealth of experience being a former member in the hierarchy of the Royal St. Lucia Police Force and having been the former Minister of National Security with all aspects of national security under one roof with no ambiguity and no confusion, he was at the helm, he was at the forefront of crime fighting in St. Lucia, former Minister of National Security. Thank you very much, um, Master of Ceremonies. I want to recognize our political leader, um, Honorable Alan Shastley. I also want to recognize um, the Honorable Guy Joseph, the right guy. Um, <laughs> Dominic Fede, who is the leader of government business in the upper house. Um, Senator Ferrer Bolius, one of our dynamic um, speakers and, and members of the United Workers Party. I want to also recognize the head table. I mean, these guys have done such a fantastic job that I really don't know why I'm up here. <laughs> you know? But I need to speak. It, it took me quite a long while before making any public pronouncements on the crime situation in this country. As I did not want to be construed as being political. Crime, I thought, is too much of a vexing issue for political parties to point fingers and play the blame, the blame game. There are just certain moments when we must put our country first, and this is one such occasion. However, today, I feel obliged or obligated to speak as too many blunders are being made at the policy level. These missteps are seriously undermining our ability to arrest the current crime situation in the country. Too many of our young men are falling prey to gun violence, while hundreds more remain at risk. The government seems satisfied with just blaming the police. Like he has said on many occasions, Prime Minister Philip J. Pierre 
has failed to show leadership on crime. His failure to lead on this matter is of great, grave national concern and undermines our collective resolve to overcome the country's perennial crime situation. Please allow me to express my deepest sympathy to all those families still grieving from the death of a loved one who have perished to the gun violence and other forms of illicit activity. I understand your pain and anguish. And today you are in my greatest you are my greatest inspiration in making the following pleas to the government. One, establish a national forum for all leaders of society to work together to overcome this matter, which has now reached crisis proportions. Two, mobilize additional help from our friendly governments, especially traditional allies, to train and arm our police with more equipment and weapons. The government must therefore be very cautious on how it navigates the international controversy between Russia and Ukraine. Now is not the time to make risky international diplomacy blunders. Allowing Russians to apply to our CIP programs while the rest of our Caribbean neighbors are doing the opposite may well alleviate some of the international allies we need in this important fight. <laughs> Send a more decisive message to the perpetrators of crime, and I implore the judiciary to assist. No, mis no mixed messages at this time must be sent that would undermine the brave efforts of our policemen and women on the front line of this battle today. Four, ensure that law enforcement officers at our ports of entry are equipped with the necessary tools to detect and intersect illegal guns being smuggled into our shores. Five, continue to improve our radar co coverage of our borders. This will allow us to better survey and patrol our territorial borders, especially at key entry points for illegal substances. Six, as a matter of urgency, expand the Coast Guard fleet to better intercept illegal firearms and other substances destined for our shores. Very importantly, seven, continue the CCTV program started by the United Workers' Party to give island-wide coverage in areas where crime is very prevalent. However, in closing, I must reiterate that no one measure or any one person or political party can do this alone. The government must therefore galvanize the abundance of human talent and interests that prevail throughout our society. It must form a strong coalition between churches, trade unions, civil society groups, community leaders and members of the public. This is our country and we must do everything we can to save it. I thank you. Thank you very much, former Minister of National Security, Human Guild, Francis. And that brings us to the end of this United Workers Party press conference this morning. Any questions from the media? Sheffield? One question. Minister of National Security. Um, you kind of prefaced it, um, but what do you think of the um, ESFP administration set up whereby <coughs> Home Affairs says that they're responsible for the administration um, and then the PM is saying that he's responsible for national security? Um, <laughs> and any thoughts on that ministerial setup and do you think that it's sort of like I, I think that's a, that's a very, very, very wonderful question. Uh, and I think it, cap, it, it encapsulates all the issues and problems that we're now facing. The Ministry of Home Affairs and Justice is almost like, like twins. You know, si, uh, what do you call them? Siamese si, I mean, twins. You can't separate it. The very same departments that fall under Home Affairs fall within the purview of national security. For a Minister of Finance, where are we now going through all these financial issues and problems that this country is faced to take on the issue of national security is really, really not in keeping with what, what has to be done. <laughs> Secondly, you take the Minister of, the, of Home Affairs, somebody with no experience whatsoever in law enforcement, no knowledge of what 
um, drives a police force. Nothing to, to deal with bodily correctional facility, not even the fire service, the forensic lab. How can that person ever be able to be able to identify with the officers that work in this department? So I want to make a recommendation, and the honorable Prime, um, leader of the opposition is here, that when he invited me to become a minister, he gave me the heavyweight portfolio of home affairs, justice, and national security. And that was where there was the thought process, because those departments are intertwined. You know, one cannot operate without the other. When the police go out there and they do their work, it is the court system that will assist them in making sure that the right message is sent. So by being the minister of those three departments, although it was a lot of work, um, and I must, I must tell the, 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 the former PM and political leader about this, I think that this ministry should go back to where it was. What my recommendation is, is that you should have junior ministers to deal with the specifics. So you have the minister overall, and you have a junior minister dealing with national security, a junior minister dealing with justice, and, and so on. The Prime Minister of Barbados has it. The Prime Minister of Barbados must be recognized, and St. Vincent. They are lawyers. They understand the, 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 the judicial system. What they have done is to take over the portfolio of home affairs and national security. But they have junior ministers. A prime minister is too busy to be able to just to, to, to continue dealing with these important issues. So this is my recommendation. Like I think that the United Work, the St. Lucia Labour Party came in without a plan. And as they are going along, they are just doing things. I'm sure you remembered that is only when persons were questioning who was the Minister of National Security? I'm sure the press, you can remember that. You were asking who is the Minister of National Security? And then, almost for about a month and a half, and then the Prime Minister just got up one night or one morning and said, well, I'm going to take it. You cannot run a government or ministry that is so important like that. And so thank you for your question. Any questions before I go? I can go, yeah. Any other questions? Um, just, just one more. Um, I was just wondering, um, um, would you be able to provide any insight as to where you think all these um, illegal firearms are coming into, into the country? Okay, thank you very much again for your question. When we came in, the first thing that we recognized that our radars were down. The radar system was down and we were having issues with persons coming in to our community without um, being detected. And we, we spent a lot of time with the RSS to assist us in the plane going around and, and, and seeing what is happening to us. Um, what we must recognize is that a lot of the, the um, ammunition and firearms that are coming in are coming through barrels for our ports of entry. We know that. We now have a very cozy relationship with Venezuela. Venezuela is only a few miles away from St. Lucia. And if you have noticed lately, when the commissioner spoke, he said lately he has noticed that a lot of fishermen are going out and getting lost. And you have to question that. That means a lot of our fishermen are venturing beyond the areas where they normally went to catch fish. And so you must, based on that, you have to ask the question, but why are they going so far out there? Okay, are they really fishing for fish? Or are they going to fish for other things? And I'm telling you that we have to. And as a government, we took a decision to look at Venezuela very closely. And this government has come in and removed every restriction or every um, um, thing that we did to make sure that we kept this country um, um, safe. So I believe that some of those firearms and the high weapon, um, um, caliber of weapons that you're now hearing especially the last shooting of the police officer, persons who were in that area, and I'm sure the Prime Minister heard the gun, the gun, the gun, the gun fire, were rapid. So it was an automatic weapon that was used. And we cannot... So we cannot get these sort of things just coming from the bars. This, we have to also look at our territorial waters. And that is why I've said that border control was very important. It was extremely important. And surprisingly, 
that this government has not even mentioned it. The Americans were going to give us three Coast Guard vessels. St. Vincent has a 54-foot vessel that can go out for weeks in the ocean because there is sleeping accommodation, there is kitchen and everything. We in St. Lucia need a couple of these boats so we can put one in the south and one in the north. The police, there's police officers go out there and they spend time out there. They have the radars, we're in touch with the RSS plane and so when we see certain things, we call the plane and we said, well, we noticed a, a boat going out across the St. Lucia, southeast or southwest, and then our boats in, on land can then go directly to that um, vessel. And this is, th this is some of the things that we do. They, 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 these are the tough decisions that we made. Uh, and so it has to take a, a, a very strenuous effort on the part of this government to be able to deal with these other things. We talked about bringing everybody in. And one of the things I always said that the Ministry of, of Home Affairs, Justice and National Security is such an important ministry that there should be an overlap. That a minister is coming in, new, the former minister should be able to sit with you for about a month or two and tell you these are the plans that I had before. This is what we have done before. This is the um, direction that we are going. And the minister will then decide whether she wants, he or she wants to follow your, your advancements or not. But it has to be that. And, and that's what we are now asking for. Okay? A coordinated effort by everybody. And this United Workers Party stand willing and ready to assist the government in making sure that our people of St. Lucia are safe. Thank you. Again, that was that was a knee-jerk reaction by the Prime Minister. Again, if he was a lawyer or he had some legal training, he would recognize that the Firearm Act is very, very, very strong. It is very strong. You get 10 years on 20 years. Okay, hundred thousand dollars fine. So, and I mentioned it earlier. So the judiciary has to assist us. When you get these individuals with a firearm and he goes to, to court, you can charge him up to fifty thousand dollars or send him to jail for up to ten years. On a second offense, he can go to jail for fifteen years. So the law is there. Okay, it is for the application. It is for everybody to come together and apply the law. Okay, we can't behave like we exist in space. You know, the police officers are going out there risking their lives every day. Now there's a, a threat against police officers, yet still they continue to do their work and get the firearms off the street. But you give a man a slap of the risk and he's out there again. I'm not criticizing anybody per se, but I am asking for the assistance and the support of the judiciary in making sure that firearm offenses are dealt with severely. Any other questions? No more questions. <laughs> okay. Um, we heard a recommendation from the former Minister of National Security for the appointment or assignment of junior ministers. We must note that the Prime Minister's office does have a junior minister. We left to wonder whether any of those two junior ministers, whether any of those responsibilities for national security can be passed on to either one of them and whether they are credible or capable of handling such responsibilities. We have a, a message, you sent it to me, from Choice News. From the media. Okay, it's not from Choice. We have a message, a question for the former Minister of Equity. Do you believe that social programs are targeted to our ghetto, uh, uh, targeted enough to our ghettos. Well, in response to this question, you will recall that I said specifically that when it comes to our safety net programs, we should exercise more targeting. There is, in terms of poverty, we can determine who qualifies for that nomenclature. For example, there is this tool that is used, the SL net uh, uh, measuring tool that is used to determine this. So it is more objective and fair uh, without any 
kind of bias or influences or unwanted influences. But in, in terms of the ghetto youth, I do not want to single out any cohort, any category of persons. It is about who requires the assistance, who needs the help. Very often, so-called ghetto youth are in communities, in, in societies that are deprived and depressed. And of course, it is important that government devise programs, go into those communities, devise programs that will be tailored to and will suit the needs of those people there. Because uh, you would recognize it's not, you know, one, one shoe fits all. It, it has to be specifically targeted and tailored for the specific needs of the different, different communities. Because you would d discover that in Grosile, for example, you would have situations of one kind different to what might obtain in Viewfort. And so targeting is necessary, yes, but uh, not just for ghetto youth, but across the board generally. Thank you. We have another question. Um, I, you didn't send it to me. I don't have it. Okay, that didn't come across. Okay, we are okay. This is uh, from somebody else here. New names were added to the poverty list during the last administration to help ease the burden. But the current prime minister has said it was done because of politics. Can the leader of the opposition or the former minister of equity see how names are added to the poverty list? Very easily, I indicated that there is a tool that we use that targets people and determine on merit whether they are deserving of the assistance. And if an, a, an assertion, if an assertion is being made that there was any bias or preferential interference, that is an attack on the social workers because they are the ones who were spearheading the effort. So if whoever is making that claim is aware come out straight and make the accusation at the social workers, the SSDF, the, Min the Ministry of Equity and Social Justice. And, and I would like to say as a former minister, during my tenure, I saw or knew of no such evidence. I believe they were doing their job fairly and they were uh, applying an equitable, just assessment to, uh, to ascertain who is deserving and who was in need. And we have a, another question here. What is the, uh, this is for uh, Honorable Bradley Felix, member of the opposition. What is the government trying to do with the youth economy? Do, do you have any idea of what that is? <laughs> well, I, I cannot speak to what the current government is uh, what the plans are for the youth economy. Sometimes I believe it's a phrase that is bandied about there because it sounds nice, um, but we have not necessarily heard any plans. I am looking forward to the budget to see what really is in place for the youth economy. But what I know we, uh, the last administration did, and I pointed them out earlier, was to provide incentives to various startup companies. A lot of young people are in business and they find it very difficult very, very difficult because of the amount of money they have to spend, particularly when they bring in items from overseas. And we put in place incentives where these items could be brought in duty-free, which is a significant cost for them. The Ministry of Commerce provides significant support in terms of providing business plans, um, um, financial advice, registering your business, all of which either free or at great discounts for, for young people. So I would like to see the current government emulate, and as I said, to even increase upon, you know, um, the, the, what can be provided for young people. You know, we heard the former, the, the former, uh, well, the current prime minister. He spoke to, he spoke to a smart city um, in, in the cul-de-sac area, and um, I, I'm, I'm hopefully to entice young people. Well, we're hoping to see some sort of reality to that because you know our young people are anxiously waiting. Some of them bought into the into the campaign promises of the last administration and you know um, we were really waiting patiently to see how it's going to roll out thank you i think that's it thank you very much um
to another press conference by the United Workers Party. Today with us, we discussed the alarming situation of violent crime in St. Lucia. We had the former president of the Senate and uh, candidate for Castries North, Janine Girodi, the honorable or former Minister of Equity and Social Justice, Leonard Spider Montout, the Honorable Bradley Felix, former Minister of Commerce and current member of the opposition, and former Minister of National Security, Herman Gill Francis. I'd like to thank you once again on behalf of the United Workers Party. Stay safe, be aware of your surroundings, and still follow the protocols so you don't get sick. The United Workers Party, once again, from its headquarters at Colony House in Castries. Hope you have a wonderful day. Thank you.